Okay. Welcome, welcome. My name is Serena Jones. I am the Director at Allied Health Support Services and I'm also the co-founder here at Allied Health Virtual Conference. So welcome, whether you're watching us live or the recording, thank you so much for joining us. This is going to be a great session. We've got three amazing ladies to speak today um, and the session is titled Paediatric Feeding. So first of all, I've just got a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, questions, we love them. Make sure you ask them. Just letting you know the best way to do that is via the chat function on the right side of your screen there. So you can type them in um, whenever you like throughout the presentation and I'll manage those. We'll tend to keep the questions until the end of the presentations because I think a really nice discussion um, is great for these kinds of, of virtual conferences. Um, the the Q&A function is actually disabled, so that's the way to ask your questions. Um, we do have a fairly strict short timeline, so we'll do our best to get to questions and, and have a bit of a discussion, but um, if you're wanting more discussion or if you're wanting to contact our lovely speakers, I'm sure they'd be delighted. Uh, their contact details are on our website. Okay, participants, your live video feed is off and you should be on mute. I think you're all on mute. So don't worry, we can't hear you, we can't see you. So just sit back and enjoy. Um, and lastly, please show your respect for your peers and your colleagues. I do uh, reserve the right to remove you from the session. Okay, so our first, we have three speakers today. We have Marga Gray, OT first, then we have Eve Reed, dietitian, and then lastly we have Kylie Martin, speechy. So we're going to start off with the lovely Marga. So Marga is a paediatric OT with extensive experience in sensory integration. Marga has run her own private practice for a long time, developed a franchise of daycare centres, would you believe, is a paediatric team leader at Tyac Health um, in Brisbane and she does online mentoring and she's also found Founded Kawadi Kids, uh, the digital development um, digital development programs for children and their families. So, what a legend! Marga is absolutely wonderful. We're very lucky to have her, and I'll throw over to you now, Marga. Good evening or good afternoon. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for your kind words. So, just give me a second. Let me just get to my um, presentation, and I'll do the screen share there. So, um, sorry, I'll need to do this. And you're going to see my screen now, which, there you go, that one. And I can show that one here. Oh, my word. Um, all right, so this one's up, and we can start. And so, I am not an expert on feeding. I am an occupational therapist and I am an expert on sensory integration and um, sensory processing disorder. And from that point of view, I am very to address the feeding um, today. So first of all, why occupational therapy for feeding issues? So because of my background of sensory processing disorder, and then also, um, just the things we process in this order is there are three different um, modalities that you find under things we process in this order, which you can see there on the screen. It's quite small, I hope. You can see it. On the left, you see the sensory modulation. Sorry, Marga. Sorry, yeah. Marga. We can't see your presentation. Oh, my word. I did this. Sorry. Um, it's lovely to see your face, but we'd like to see the presentation ah, as well. Yes. Can you share your screen, please? <laughs> I did that, but I'll... Just because I don't see this one. Can you see it now? No. <laughs> It's okay. There we go. That's looking a bit more promising. Okay. Yes, we can. Go in. Yep, that's wonderful. Okay, Thanks great. so much, Margo. I am so sorry and thank you for jumping in. Um, yeah, okay. That's just one of the technical things and let's continue. So, yes, I am addressing this more or less from the sensory processing point of view because that is my area of expertise. So um, let me just 
a um, video up, if you don't mind, because then you can um, actually, um, <laughs> I think I'm going to stay here. So, um, okay, I'm going to talk about sensory repurposing disorder. On the screen, you see there on the left hand side, you have the sensory modulation disorder, sensory based motor disorders, and sensory discrimination disorders. And all of them are part of sensory processing disorder. Now, for feeding, I'm going to focus more on the sensory modulation disorder, and then I'm just going to touch on the sensory based motor disorders, um, because that's also a, a, a bit important. Um, so we're going to have a look at the sitting position at the table or wherever your child is eating. Um, the physical eating skills, the physical uh, manipulation of um, cutlery, and then also how to structure a happy meal time. But the main focus of this presentation will be on the sensory processing disorder. So let's have a look at the sensory modulation part of that. So I like to just discuss a little bit about and the difference between behavior and reaction. So from a sensory modulation point of view, uh, people often refer children to us because of their behavioral issues. But um, I really think that it is important because um, it's not always behavior. It's often not the chosen act from the, the point of the child. It is a reaction to what is happening in the child's body or in the child's um, environment. Um, so if you think of your picky eaters, um, it's not a chosen thing that I, that they choose beforehand that I won't eat this food. It is when they are presented to the food, they are either overwhelmed, either anxious, or they are just so, um, you know, the smells and the taste are just too, too much for them and they cannot handle that. And it's more a sensory reaction than a behavioral thing. And then you get the chewers, and the same thing there. They just can't help to chew just about everything they see. And um, it's, it's also a self regulation thing for them. Um, and they tend to fill, overly fill their mouths with food, and they can't really feel that. You will tell them all the time, don't put so much food in your mouth, then you can't chew, but they don't realize they do that. So it's more a reaction than a behavior. Then the fatty eaters is a little bit different than the picky eaters. Picky eaters will um, pick the same food from day to day. The fatty eaters are more, um, today they will feel like having peas, but tomorrow they will refuse to have that. So um, it might have a little bit more of a behavior component, but I, I'm really reluctant to say that. So just let us look at the senses that detect our behavior or our reactions. So first of all, we talk about eight different sensations. Um, in school, we learn about the five main ones, but we add a few. So let's have a look. First of all, your sense of vision. That has to do with Food, because you see the food before you even try to eat it. And um, taste, of course, when you put the food in your mouth, you might like it or you might not like it. Smells definitely has to do with food. And um, hearing, you don't often think hearing has to do with food, but actually, when you chew, you can hear everything you do. And if you chew crunchy things and then you are sensitive to that noise, then it's not a nice sensation and we will avoid um, too, too crunchy um, food. The other thing is um, touch. And touch is, yes, the touch of the food on your lips. Um, but I see a lot of picky eaters who are also tactile defensive children. So indirectly touch has something to do with food and feeding. Then you have the sense of proprioception. That is to tell your brain in which position your body is. So it's not only your body, but also your mouth and which movement that is your mouth making. And um, that will, sorry, yeah, that will make a, a big difference. Um, and then you get the sense of movement. So that's the movement of your jaw muscles. Also, your ability to sit still at the table and um, all your ability to. Um, move around and um, to stand up and walk around um, and that, that's often not 
the visits at the dining room table, but you need to consider that some children need a lot more movement than others. The last sense is the sense of interoception, and that is the one that tells your brain what is going on inside your body. So that will be something like, when do you feel hungry? When do you feel you cool? When do you need to go to the toilet? Are you thirsty? Are you tired? What is your heart rate like? That kind of thing. So you can see that all of these eight senses have something to do with eating. So also sensory processing disorder, we cannot talk about that without talking about the sensory threshold. So you get the high threshold and you get low threshold. Average people with a good self-regulation and average functioning, they, optim they function in the optimal levels of the, these thresholds. They are in between the very high thresholds and the very low thresholds, um, which makes it um, easy for us. When you're tired, your threshold might be a little bit lower. When you're very excited about something, it might be a little bit higher. When you're just very relaxed and you, you know, just um, very calm and relaxed, your threshold might be a bit higher. But we see a lot of children who function outside these optimal thresholds. And so when their thresholds are too high, then you get the sensory seekers and you get the people who have no registration for what is happening in their environment. And they might have a limited awareness. They often have poor attention, they can daydream, and they are often oral motor seeking or even movement seekers. So people with low thresholds are often highly alert, they are easily overwhelmed, easily um, anxious, they are usually oversensitive, and they can be defensive. Um, they can easily hop into the fright and flight reactions, and we often see avoidance behavior there. So if you just, in general, look at these thresholds, um, you'll just see that the high thresholds are more associated with the chewers, and the low thresholds are more associated with the people in there. So um, also, the information from the eight senses affects how we understand the world, it affects our arousal and activity level. It affects our self-regulation. Can we attain attention? Can we maintain attention? And we can we train attention from one task to the other? And then also it um, indicates whether you are in the flight, flight, flight mode or whether you are relaxed. So it has a big effect on our daily functioning, including eating and meal time. So let's have a look at the chewer. They have high thresholds usually. They are often sensitive and unaware, not sensitive and unaware. They um, are often sensory seekers. Um, their self-regulation is not very good and they often use this chewing to self-regulate. They can also use it to reduce anxiety. So that can be anxious, although they might have high thresholds that can have no threshold too. And like everything with sensory processing disorder, nothing is a given. Everything can change and it can change from day to day. And they often use chewing as well to improve their concentration. So they might be good chewers in the classroom. So what strategies are there to help a chewer? First of all, provide some socially appropriate, appropriate chewery. Um, it's not jewelry, it's jewelry. Like these necklaces, you get Lego necklaces, which is nice for the boys. You get some pencil toppers, which you have to chew on. Um, and it's not very obvious, so they can sit in the classroom and chew all day, actually, and uh, um, it won't attract any attention. Um, then oral motor exercises, I love to do that. And I ask them to do that like every two hours or as often as they can during the day because that helps to desensitize the body. And blowing bubbles can be one of the oral motor exercises. And chewing, and chewing gum, we love that. And we also say, don't say stop doing what you're doing. Don't stop 
chewing because they can't. You have to provide an alternative and another option um, instead of just saying stuff. Um, you can also address other sensory modulation issues. Usually, if they have sensory problems um, with the mouth and some movements and the sensitivities in the mouth, they usually have other modulation problems as well. So, they might be very sensitive to noise, they might be sensitive to touch, and you need to address those as well. And sometimes it's easier to address the others before you get to the eating. And then, um, crunchy and chewy lunch packs might help them a lot, and it will improve self regulation if they are allowed to chew and to eat. Uh, but you can use other strategies as well to improve their self regulation. So let's have a look at the picky eater. I see our time is flying. Um, so they are very selective about food choices, they might not like anything you provide them. Um, they have a degree of food neurophobia, so they don't like to eat new foods and unfamiliar foods. They don't like to sample foods. And um, they are actually often, sorry about that, they are often really um, anxious and very sensitive to many different sensations, not only to the sensations in and around the mouth. They generally have a low threshold. Um, but with the picky eaters, I want you to keep in mind that there are a few positive things. And because they have a low threshold, they can actually taste and smell much better than the average person. So they might become very good wine tasters. They might taste food and smell smells that the average person don't smell and don't taste. So they might be able to taste the sauce and tell you what is in it, which is something that I can't do. So just keep that in mind, it's not all negative to have to eat it. It can be positive as well. And so what strategies can be used to help a picky eater? Food games. I love food games. So you can play games with pretend food, but definitely with real food as well. Oral motor exercises are great to desensitize the mouth and the tongue. Um, so these are just an example of some oral motor exercises, and it's just fun to in front of the mirror pool faces and get those jaw muscles and the tongue muscles and the lip muscles working. Then there are clinics like the SOS feeding clinics, and many other um, private practices and hospitals provide feeding clinics, and you can investigate which one will be best for your child and for you. Um, then it's very difficult, very important to have patience. If you get to the point, if you're a parent listening, and you go to the point of you listen to this webinar, your patient might have run out already. So it's very important to take a deep breath and to be really patient. Um, and to remember that the child needs to be in control. The more you want to control the child, the more you push the child, the less you will succeed. So if you can if help the child to be in control, like this little boy, helping possibly his dad to prepare the barbecue, you will feel much more positive about the food than another child that's not involved in that and that doesn't, doesn't feel in control at all when they have to do the food. So also with the PPE issues, you can address some other sensory modulation issues to help them to overcome the PPE. So let's have a look at the sitting posture. So this is the optimal posture. To sit at the table, back upright, head upright, feet flat on the floor, and the table up at, at the correct height. That will make it easy for the child to swallow, it will make it easy for the child to maintain that position. If the seating is not in a good um, it's not in a good height, it's not um, you know the child isn't sitting properly at the table, then they might 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 find it really difficult to finish a meal. And they might wiggle and they might want to stand up. And it might be very uncomfortable to swallow and to chew. Um, so you have to consider low tone and, and poor core muscles. If that is a big problem, you might consider supported seating. And there are many different options, um, but just to support the child's posture because they find it so difficult to sit upright, and then they have to focus on sitting upright and they have to focus on their feet and on the actual um, eating. So you also have to consider muscle strength and also the muscle strength of the mouth and the tongue muscles. 
also another option for teaching is like a moving to pillow where you give the child some um, options for movement. Um, I think, you know, if the, muscle, the mouth and tongue muscles aren't well developed, then um, they might find it really difficult to move the food around in the mouth and to get the food to the back of the mouth where they need to swallow. Um, so what is the mechanics of eating? First of all, eating is a whole body experience. It's also a whole brain experience. We use the brain stem, the very primitive part of the brain to smell and taste. We use the midbrain to chew and to swallow. We use the emotional brain to have those emotional connections with food. All of us have one favorite food or a food that your grandma or somebody cooked and when you smell it, you just have that whole emotional connection to it and you just think of your grandma and you think, oh, how lovely it was to be in your house when she cooked that food. Um, then also your thinking brain uh, is, is involved in eating because you have to think about the food, you have to think which one you want to eat and which one you don't want to eat. Then as we said before, all your senses are involved in eating. So it's a very complex task. Um, so let's have a quick look at the physical feeding skills. The timing to introduce the input is quite important. Some kids like to use that from a very early age. They can barely sit and then they would like to love to play with the spoon. Other people uh, and other kids try to avoid it as long as possible. And um, it's good to play food games with non-food items like Play-Doh, learn to cut and specifically um, to use a spoon while you use non-food items, but also play with food without the pressure of eating it. Then you have to have a look at the hand muscles. The dexterity in the hand and in hand manipulation of the pencil. If a child has bilateral coordination or bilateral integration problems, they find it really difficult to manipulate a knife and a fork. And they will often ask you to cut the wrist um, and they will often remove to eat with their hands. Um, spoon foods are easier to eat. Fork foods are, can also be easy if the child can manipulate that fork. But it can be difficult as well. Um, you might use some adapted cutlery if necessary if a child has very low microphone in the hand or find it really tricky to manipulate cutlery. So, ideas to make eating enjoyable please steer away from these orange crosses. Don't get into a fight with this child. Completely steer away from that. That is not helpful and it will only create. Um, very negative connections to food and to meal time. Be positive, let them play with food, let them make mess, let them, it's all good. Make them um, be behind your child, help when necessary, and don't face the face your child. Um, try to be there as a support and not as a um, disciplinary person. So, ideas to make eating enjoyable. We, you can play with that. I've had that on a paper plate and I just drew a circle and the two eyes and a mouth and the kids had a ball to put different foods and to make different um, faces. And um, make the child involved in the preparation of food. A game like this is great. You can buy this tray and you can put different foods in there. With a picky eater, put the same food in all of, all of them and be very happy if they eat some of it. Um, I would not go into that one very early um, if your child is a really uh, fussy picky eater, rather um, just give them food that they enjoy. Um, and I'm sure the other two speakers will give you plenty more ideas. Involving in the preparation of food, um, that is where they learn to love food and they might have an emotional, positive connection with food. At meal time, structure a happy meal time. Structure a time that is a lovely time for your family, a lovely time for um, to share ideas, to share what happened during the day, um, to enjoy the food, to talk about the food, talk about and um, which food they like, which food they don't like that much. Talk about what happens when you put one sauce on your meat and the same sauce on your broccoli, and you see what happens then. So make it a fun, enjoyable time, and um, yes, thank you so much. 
um, to be able to share this. I'm sure you have a, a question right at the end, and I'm looking forward to listening to the next two speakers. Thank you. Thank I'll you so much. You. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marga. And I do apologise, everyone. The sound is not great. Um, yeah, we've had a few diffi te technical difficulties today, but we'll, we'll go on. There's so much um, valuable content here today. So don't forget, everybody, you'll get the recording in your inbox in the next couple of days. Um, and I'm sure the ladies can pass on their slides. So um, we can get that to you as well. All right, thanks so much again, Marga. If you wanna pop yourself off um, your live video feed, great, okay, alrighty. I will move on now so that we don't go too far over time. I've been advised we've got a, a couple of talkers in our speakers today, so we'll keep moving. Eve Reed is our next lovely presenter. Welcome, Eve. Eve is an accredited practicing dietitian specialising in paediatric nutrition. She has over 30 years experience holding head of department roles and co-authoring three books on children's nutrition and health and setting up Family Food Works, which focuses on child health through family nutrition and education for parents, health professionals and child educators. Thanks so much for joining us, Eve. It's a pleasure to be here um, and um, I'll start with my slides so that um, <laughs> I, get it, I get it all in. Get it all sorted. Um, yep. Um, okay, so I will stop my video. Ah, hide myself. <laughs> hide myself. <laughs> um, and share my screen. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, raising healthy or I'm, I'm going to use the word competent um, eaters a lot during this pre presentation. Um, because I think, um, and you'll, you'll see why I um, refer to children becoming competent eaters and what that means. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the SATA feeding dynamics model. And some of you may have heard of Ellen SATA as a, and her approach to feeding and to eating. And um, basically, the um, backbone of the SATA eating model is the division of responsibility in feeding. And when parents feed um, this way, children, um, it leads children to become eating competent. And I'll talk a bit about what that means. So the division of responsibility in feeding um, means that the parent decides what when and where of feeding and the children decide child decides how much to eat and whether to eat um, you may have heard of this and it seems fairly simple but in fact it's very difficult for some ch parents um, to make those decisions and take that leadership so children what do i mean by competent eaters um, so children are competent eaters when they uh, have a positive attitude to, to eating. They, um, they enjoy eating, um, there's no issues with um, coming to the table. They don't become upset if there is unfamiliar food on the table. They um, eat as much as they want and they stop when they're full and that's something that we want all of us to continue doing because we're all born with that ability and they come to the table willingly and enjoy family meals and behave well there so like other oops sorry like other things that children learn um, such as playing baseball or softball or cricket or any other skill. Um, parents teach their, their children 
these skills. And in order to, um, if you think about how you would teach a child to play a particular sport or game, um, we need to understand their temperament, their learning style, where they're at developmentally. So we wouldn't expect a three-year-old, for example, to eat the same variety of foods as a 12 or 13 or 14 year olds. Just the same as you wouldn't expect a three-year-old to bat in cricket, the same as you would a 14 year old. Um, parents need to, so that we need to um, offer children developmentally appropriate foods and expect developmentally appropriate behaviours. We need to give them lots of opportunities to learn. So fortunately, we need children um, have five meals a day. And so they have lots of opportunities over their life to be exposed to new foods and see it as an opportunity to learn to like the foods that their parents eat. And we, as we teach children new school skills, we trust that they will be able to learn those skills. So just um, a reminder of the developmental stages that children oops, go through, um, beginning with the homeostasis at birth and um, at each, each, as you see, I've put them as building blocks because the idea is that each developmental stage builds on the next, which seems to be the case. The learning that takes place or has failed to take place at each stage informs subsequent learning. So you can think of child development as, as a stack of blocks or a jazz band where one instrument comes to the forefront for a solo, but all the others continue to play in the background. And when it comes to eating, um, you'll see that each developmental stage, if we look at from newborn onwards, um, certain tasks take centre stage. So, for example, in the old, if we look at the older baby, five to nine months, and of course the age is going to, um, it's a general age with a quite a big range, the child developmentally is getting interested in things. So they are interested in toys. They're interested in putting, starting to put things in their mouth. And at this stage in feeding, um, they eat best when um, they have some input into eating solid food. So, you know, they, they can either pick it up with their hands, they can um, make a mess with it, as Margot said, Marga said. Um, and trusting the developmental tempo of the child is really important, important. And to put away, you know, feeding agendas so that, um, you know, whether it's that they should be eating certain foods or that they should be um, able to use a fork by this age. Um, we need to work where, with the child where it's developmentally appropriate. Uh, so what are the principles of the feeding dynamics model? Well, the parents guide feeding by taking leadership um, within the feeding rela relationship. Um, they provide leadership by deciding what foods are offered at each meal. And they give the child, that's one of their leadership responsibilities. And they give the child autonomy that relates to their ever changing developmental needs. And children um, remain or become competent eaters with regards to deciding how much to eat, with deciding which foods to choose from what's on offer and with mealtime behaviour. So the parents take the leadership over what is served, not by um, 
letting the child decide what's on the menu or asking them, what would you like for dinner, darling? Um, it's the parent needs to decide what is the menu for each of those five meals and snacks each day. Of course, they can be considerate without catering. So, you know, they know that one child has a particular like for a particular food, so they're going to present that every now and then. But it's not only foods that you know that your child will eat. Um, they decide when eating is allowed, and that's a really important one. Um, not letting children graze or drink uh, um, other drinks apart from water between meals. Um, we want children to come to meals hungry, and if they're grazing or going to the pantry or uh, helping themselves to um, the fridge in between meals, then they're not going to be hungry at a meal time. And also the parent needs to decide where the eating is allowed. So not in front of the TV, only at the table or on the picnic rug when we're at the park. Um, so the, the parent decide, decides where eating takes place. But the child always decides how much to eat and whether or not to eat at each particular meal. So how can parents help children become competent eaters? Well, first of all, they need to cho choose and prepare the food. They need to have initiate regular meals and snacks. A lot of parents say to me, but my child never says that they're hungry. Well, it's not the child's job to tell a parent when they're hungry, apart from in infancy when they, um, when we demand feed. But after the about nine, 10 months of age, it's up to the parent to initiate meals and, um, and the child will know that they're going to be fed at regular intervals and that they don't have to ask for food. Um, the parent takes leadership with making mealtimes pleasant and we'll see soon a video of a very unpleasant mealtime. And unfortunately, um, I see a lot of children who have unpleasant meal times. Um, parents need to have expectations um, that are developmentally appropriate of how um, children should behave and be able to feed themselves at a meal time and accept that children will eat the right amount of food for their predetermined growth. Um, predetermined growth. So children who have food available and are not, um, don't have a, a medical problem that's going to affect their appetite will grow, will eat the amount of food that they need to grow according to their genetic potential. Um, as you can see, um, this is another way of representing the division of responsibility in eating, in eating, and the goal is eating competence rather than a particular weight or particular um, amount of food that um, the child should be eating. You can see that there's a double yellow line down the bottom, and really that's to represent the fact that the parent and the child have very defined um, roles, and if they into in the, if they try and do each other's job, um, that's where feeding problems arise. Uh, so, when parents feed according to the division of responsibility, children preserve their natural abilities and become competent eaters. And when we've seen this slide before, what it, what it means to be a competent eater. And children are born competent eaters. They know how much they need to eat. Um, and that um, continues throughout childhood if we feed according to the division of responsibility. So a child 
with a positive attitude feels good about eating. They're enjoying being fed or feeding themselves. They're comfortable with unfamiliar food. So have a look at Sean and um, he's an example of not being comfortable with um, unfamiliar food. What you get? Mm. Some green beans. I am going to get you noodles, you see, but you also need to eat the green beans, please. I want it. I These are noodles, you see? These are noodles. I'm giving you noodles and green beans. That's a good one. Ooh, that's a nice big one. Mmm, yummy. Hey, look at that. You asked me for more noodles, but you're not even eating them, dude. Are they yucky today? Did you see color they're having now? Watermelon, you want this watermelon? Of course he does. Okay, uh, two more bites of watermelon, and then one green bean. And then four more bites of watermelon. Okay, good. So two bites of watermelon, one green beans, and then four more bites of watermelon. Good time. I like green beans. I don't know why they don't like green beans. And then put it on your mouth really fast, and then... And then drink some milk. Okay, put it in your mouth really fast, and then no, no. and then show us some milk, quick, quick. No, that trick's not working. That trick's not working today. No. So you can see that Sean's mum is not following the division of responsibility in several ways. She's not allowing Sean to pick and choose from what is on offer. She obviously he's asked for noodles and um, or she's asked him what he wants and he said, I want noodles. And then of course he's not eating them. So um, that's the trap that parents fall into when they ask their children what they want to eat. And Bright, we know um, that um, with regard to food acceptance, that children will eat. They know they will eat a variety of food if they're fed according to the division of responsibility. But they won't um, feed well if they're if the parent crosses that line and tries to do the child's job of deciding how much to eat and what to eat from what's on offer. So we know that picky eating is universal. universal. Um, studies have shown that parents of children as young as four to six months um, perceive their child as being a picky eater. Um, of course, what a picky eater um, means to each parent is different, but in general, it's not um, from my experience, um, parents think their child is a picky eater when they won't eat the whole range of foods that they're being offered or that they'll only eat a few foods or that they only like particular foods. But we need to understand what is normal eating behaviour. And, you know, it's very normal for children to eat a lot one day or, and a little the next. In fact, it's common for them to eat different amounts at different meals throughout the day, or more at lunch one day and less at lunch the next day. Um, they don't always eat a complete meal of meat and three veg like we would offer them. They may pick or choose only one or two foods at a meal. They can change what they want to eat from one day to the next. They, you know, parents will say they ate baked beans every day and then they stopped eating them, which is very um, common. And they rarely eat a new food the first time, of course, except for French, you know, chips and lollies and chocolate, perhaps. Um, and you can see that mothers um, in this study, they gave up, they give up offering the new food for um, after a specific number of times, sometimes only three, you know, usually 
um, three to five times. Whereas if they were um, offering the family meal or the a, a variety of different foods, but not varying it every day, um, then children would have regular exposure. Like, for example, if your child doesn't like um, spaghetti bolognese and salad, they don't. They may pick just the spaghetti one week, but then that meal is going to come around many times over that child's childhood, and so they're going to be exposed to or being offered that meal, not just once or twice, but many, many, many times. And each time they might pick and choose different meal uh, foods from the same meal that they're being offered. And we know that feet pressure, putting pressure on children to eat um, doesn't work. And when I say pressure, I mean things like forcing, bribing, coercing, applauding, rewarding, um, distracting. Uh, it's very common for children to um, be fed with a device um, in order to get them to eat. So when it, as soon as I hear parents saying, I wanna know how to get my child to eat vegetables or how to get my child to eat more or less, um, I know that there's there will usually be some form of pressure there. And pressure, we know that many parents put pressure on children. We know that pressure leads to anxiety and anxiety can actually um, lessen a child's appetite. And we also know that a lot of children have feeding problems, possibly as a result of lots of pressure. Children who are competent with eating um, know are allowed to eat as much or as little as they want at each meal. So here's Tiara. Four-year-old Tiara is ready to eat and is good at managing her taco. Sometimes Tiara eats hardly anything. Other times she eats more than you can imagine. That's fine. She knows what she's doing but extremes in eating can be hard on parents. Tiara glances her parents from time to time. However, her attention is on her eating. This little girl is hungry. Tiara's almost finished with her second taco and is still eating steadily. She's businesslike about her eating and gives it her full attention. She's eating guacamole and chips as well. She can't get enough guacamole using the chips and resorts to eating it with a spoon. Nick is getting nervous about how much his daughter is eating. Maybe a little lettuce will slow her down. Tiara looks unhappy. Her past experience has taught her that eat your lettuce means don't eat so much. Tiara wants a third taco, but Nick looks over her plate. Tiara understands what that means and knows he'll try to talk her out of it. Trying to get Tiara to eat less will make her eat more and teach her to be ashamed of her eating. Tiara goes along with her father and doesn't have the shell. Nick needs to relax and let her eat. Tiara knows how much she needs to eat, and his well-intended input undermines her knowing. By now, Nick is trying to get her to stop. Tiara doesn't look happy. She wants to keep eating, and she's well aware that her father thinks she's eating too much. So... We also know that parents that try and restrict their children um, usually um, have, it has the opposite effect um, and they become afraid of going hungry and they overeat when you get when they get the chance. So um, if I um, see children who parents describe them as um, eating quickly, trying to eat as much as they can, 
or sneaking food in between meals or hiding food, that usually um, means that that child has been restricted because their parents are either afraid they're going to become overweight or um, have not fed them or have fed them in a way that they have had some form of weight acceleration. So food restriction um, comes in many forms. It can be um, trying to get children to eat less and it can be very subtle. It can be the look, um, like, you know, the look of you've had enough, haven't you? Or it's actually saying when they ask for more food, saying, surely you can't be still hungry. Um, all sorts of, there are all sorts of um, messages that kids get that um, give them the feeling that their parents don't trust their, their appetite. And we know that um, children who feel that they are too, uh, fat or, um, or overweight feel that something's wrong with them and that um, children as young as five try to eat only a little bit on purpose so that, so that they don't get fat, um, which is really a sad state of affairs, in fact. Um, a child who's competent with eating enjoys family meals and behaves well there. So uh, many parents avoid having family meals for one reason or another. However, we know that children who have regular family meals do better in every way. Um, there are many studies looking at children um, at family meals and what and the consequences. And we know, um, particularly in adolescence, that um, children who have more family meals than others um, have better have a better nutritional intake. They have less um, are less overweight, they have less drug and alcohol abuse. And so you can't start having family meals when the children become adolescents. It has, it's something that happens um, from an early age. Um, and family, here are some of the other um, researched effects of family meals. So um, less eating less, unhealthy food, reduction in the risk of overweight, reduction in disordered eating behaviours. Um, and we know that routine, as in structured meals and snacks, reduces the risk of obesity in preschoolers. So the structured eating is really important. Um, we don't... Cognitively, children aren't ready to learn about nutrients um, and you know, different um, food groups and, and much about nutrition until they're in their adolescence. And really, nutrition in children really is through experiential learning of seeing and touching. And so trying to get children to eat less and to understand what's healthy and what's not healthy um, is very difficult in younger children. So just in summary, the division of responsibility is the backbone of eating competence and eating competence is the goal of feeding children. Um, so from a nutrition point of view, um, we need to depend on the and respect the child's capabilities with food acceptance. Not every child is going to eat a, a wide variety of foods right from the beginning. It's something that they learn over their whole childhood. And we need to trust our child's capabilities with food regulation and that they're going to eat the right amount of food for their body. Um, Family meals are the um, basis of structured meals and snacks. Um, it allows children to go to meals hungry um, and allows them to eat until they're satisfied. It also become, it, it, um, keeps food from being a constant issue between parent and child. How many times do you hear 
parents who are saying, oh, they want a snack all afternoon. Um, we're always trying to get them out of the cupboards and, and trying to get them not to eat. Um, however, if they would have a structured afternoon tea with filling nutritious foods and know that they can eat as much as they want and, and then that's it till dinner time, there'd be less conflict between um, parents and children around food. Oops. So structure is, at the, as, as part of the division of responsibility, is so important in um, overweight prevention and treatment and in feeding children in general. general. Um, if you want to learn more about the SATA model um, and the division of responsibility, um, these are just some of the possibilities. I'm, I'm running a workshop in Melbourne in September, a whole day on working effectively with um, childhood eating challenges. Um, I do provide supervision for health professionals that um, and dietitians in particular who are working in paediatrics. Um, the Ellen Satter Institute has a clinical Facebook page that you can look up and join um, and discuss case, cases there. And the ellensatterinstitute.org um, has many um, free webinars, um, articles, blogs, newsletters, that um, can give you more information and insight into this model of feeding. Um, these are wonderful resources for your clients, um, which are available from my website. And um, as, um, as we were told at the beginning, we'll um, hopefully have time for questions at the end. Thanks so much, Eve. Really valuable content, um, not only from a professional point of view, but personally, I'm going to rejig a couple of things at my house with my own paediatrics. <laughs> I'm sure all the other parents out there are thinking the same thing. Um, well, or <laughs> for that. <laughs> Professionally, very good content. What a great model. Um, and thank you. Your upcoming workshop looks really cool too. Alrighty, we might move on and then we'll have a bit of a, a chat at the end. Okay, Kylie. Kylie Martin is a speech pathologist and the founder director at Chatterbox's Speech Pathology here on the sunny coast. She is passionate about evidence-based paediatric care and provides kindy screening, mentoring and corporate and community education sessions. Uh, so Kylie contributes to the online mag Source Kids and has authored her own book, Kylie. Is that right? <laughs> Super lovely to have you. Thanks so much for your time, Kylie. You're on mute, Kylie. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Excellent. All right, let me just fix this up. All right. So thank you, everybody, for um, tuning in tonight. Um, as, as Serena said, um, I'm the director of Chatterboxes. I'm also the director of the Sunshine Coast Children's Development Centre. And here at our centre, we have a multidisciplinary clinic with um, speech pathology, occupational therapy, dietetics, psychology, and our Happy Eaters Food School. Um, and I've titled my little talk tonight, um, Feeding Frenzy. And the reason is, is that we will have parents come in with children with all sorts of disability, um, ranging in all sorts of severity, speech, language, sensory motor, psychological anxiety, depression, all sorts of things. And consistently, if there is a range of difficulties or a range of issues that need to be addressed, parents will uh, um, rate feeding as their number one concern. So regardless of whether it is or isn't the biggest issue, in the parent's mind, it is the biggest issue. And so um, there's a, a lot of emotion, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety around the whole issue of feeding. Um, you know, basically from the time a parent brings a child home from the hospital, their number one goal is to keep that child alive. 
And when the child refuses to feed and screams all day and night and causes nipple damage and won't sleep and coughs and chokes and has repeated chest infections and ear, nose and throat infections and won't transition to solids and doesn't put on weight and reacts to what they eat because of allergy and um, only eats certain colours and textures and this whole process of difficulty is repeated three to five times a day and the only options that the medical community have is medication, take the food away, wait until they're hungry, and then they'll eat. And then when these kids don't eat, they suggest um, hospitalisation, nasogastric feeding. It's no wonder that parents are stressed and rate feeding as their number one concern. So I don't necessarily want to go back over and cover the sensory issues or any particular model of feeding. Um, I want to address some of the um, facts that, or um, fiction things that parents often get sidetracked on when it comes to feeding. Talk about the issues related to that so that you can guide parents through the journey um, in an informed way and take away some of the stress and anxiety for them so that they can approach feeding um, from a much more informed and a much more um, balanced perspective. So the first um, fact or fiction issue that I want to look at is this perception that eating is the body's number one priority. Um, I know that when you have a hangry or hungry or angry child or adult for that matter, who is having a temper tantrum because they want the pepper Pig yogurt and they want it now, it might well seem like eating is the body's number one priority, but actually, the human body can survive up to three weeks without food, three days without water. But if the human body, body is starved of oxygen for as little as three to 10 minutes, the brain is irreparably damaged and survival is unlikely. So while it might seem that eating is the body's number one priority, breathing is in fact the body's number one priority and the body will do all that is necessary to breathe, including refusing to eat, and or limiting the types of foods that it will accept. So the mechanics involved in feeding and eating are very closely um, related. So both involve the mouth, both involve the, the pharynx or the, the upper airway, um, and both involve the soft palate, this area here, if you can see where I'm pointing. Sorry, Kylie, your presentation's not up. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So let we me, can't see where you're pointing. <laughs> okay, let me try that again. Um, sorry. You're that right. was my fault. I just forgot to do that one little step. <laughs> A lot of people do. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> okay, share screen and go back to here. All right. There we go. All right, can you see that now? Okay. Yep, we sure can, thank you. Okay, sorry for seeing the top of my head before while I was talking. <laughs> so the anatomy is that when we breathe, we take the air in through our nose or our mouth and it passes down um, the back of our throat and down um, into our windpipe or our trachea which is uh, this front portion here. When we swallow, the food goes in as well. The mechanics sort of work around to push the food back down into the esophagus. So you can see how closely related that anatomy there is. And if the anatomy for breathing is not um, coordinated, is not strong, is not effective, um, the body is going to put a bit of a halt on this swallowing process so that it can keep breathing smoothly. Um, if this, this um, system here becomes poorly coordinated, then it, there is a whole lot of um, health risks that can be associated with that. So the body is going to say no to eating, no to feeding, no to swallowing if it's got to make a choice between feeding and breathing. So... Um, the, com the conversation around all of the mechanics of swallowing, I'll say for a little bit later on, but I guess the first conversation that we need to have is, is the child medically stable to eat or is the child medically stable to feed? 
Um, because eating is work and the act of eating burns calories and requires the body to exert energy, um, this places neurological demand and energy demand on the body. And this causes the change, uh, causes a change in the rate and depth of breathing. So again, if eating is hard work, a child is probably going to choose not to eat in preference to breathing. Um, if the effort of eating outweighs the benefit of oral nutrition in terms of a medical assessment, then we will look at a nasogastric um, tube. We need to have these kids breathing um, safely and stably before we can go down the path of looking at their oral intake and how much oral intake they have. If the effort of breathing takes up the majority of a child's attention and energy, then there's going to be little incapacity to reserve for and devote to feeding. So we need to consider the capacity and demands um, of a child. If the effort for feeding impacts too much on the respiratory system, then the length of feed and the type of foods offered need to be considered as well. We probably need to make the meal times rather short and the foods um, rather simple so that less energy is directed into the eating, chewing, swallowing process and more energy is still available for feeding. Um, so one of the things, if we can determine that a child is medically stable but still doesn't necessarily have um, a strong or um, stable posture to support good breathing, we can come down and have a look at positioning. And I know that Marga talked a little bit about positioning. I just want to um, cover over that a little bit from the speech pathology side of things. So how a child is seated or positioned during feeding has an impact on their respiratory function. So Evans, Morris and Dunn Klein write that trunk and head control provide the stable foundation upon which the muscle systems supporting feeding and breathing can act efficiently. So what that means is a child has to be really well supported in their body and in their head before they're going to be able to coordinate breathing and swallowing. So the body is um, biologically wired to progress in feeding sophistication in line with that motor and postural development. And you can see on this next slide here that the types of foods that are introduced and the time they're introduced lines up quite um, neatly with their motor skill and that postural, that trunk and head support. So around the age of six months, a child is able to sit independently. So they start to have their own ability to control their trunk and to control their head. And this is when we start introducing solids for nutrition. As they get a little bit stronger and more sophisticated in their trunk and head control, we can increase the sophistication of foods that we're offering them. Around 12 to 24 months, they're walking, they've got really good body control. Um, their cognitive and language um, skills are starting to develop. And they're starting to eat quite sophisticated or more growing up types of food. By the time a child is three years and has really good head, neck, body, um, midline, sensory integration, sort of coordination, we can introduce these high, high risk or high complexity foods um, to, to continue on in that feeding continuum. So while I've jumped a little bit there from breathing to posture, I guess the point that I want to make here is that we not only have to see or make sure that a child is medically stable before we um, push too far on with our feeding, we need to support um, a child through their development and through their posture to be able to um, progress them on in this, um, this linear progression of feeding as well. Uh, this is what Marga spoke about before, the ideal posture of having a 90 degree angle at the hips, the knees and the feet. We'll often see children with low tone who have this slump um, position or children with high tone who have this arch in their back. These kids with this um, arch in their back will often perch themselves against a table for um, extra support. 
Um, sometimes children with low tone will have this posture as well. And they'll perch themselves against a table for extra support. When they're perching themselves against a table, they're actually compromising their respiration a little bit because the table's pressing against their diaphragm, um, which is the, the main breathing um, mechanism that we have. So setting a child up to have that angle at their hips, at their knees and at their feet is really important. Um, a few slides earlier, I had that tip trap chair um, that we often use in the clinical settings. Um, and you can purchase those for uh, homes as well. They're nice, they change um, in size with the child so you can adjust them and put them at your table. But if a child can't get their um, knees to 90 degrees, it's usually related to the depth of the seat. So we need to find them a shallower seat or put something behind their back to scoot their bottom forward so that they can get that 90 degree angle at their knees. If they can't get a 90 degree angle at their hips, which is what gives the child a good base to sit on, um, they will probably need to um, be scooted back as far as they can be in the chair, as long as their knees are still at 90 degrees, um, and then given some support at the sides to keep their hips at 90 degrees or to use the little wedge cushion that you saw in Marga's presentation that often just tilts their body forward a little bit to be able to achieve that 90 degree at their hips. Um, these children here with this, uh, sorry, children who don't have a 90 degree at the foot and um, the ground, it's often because they're on a chair that's too high for them. And you might just need to put a stack of phone books or a stool or something underneath their um, feet so that they can get that nice stabilisation and that 90 degree angle between their foot and the floor. So um, positioning is very important to be able to maintain good breath. Um, you can see obviously a child who's slouched or a child who's perched is going to have some um, compromised respiration just because um, of the way that the diaphragm is compromised in both of those positions. Um, so medically, we need to check a child out. Positionally, we need to check a child out. And we also need to just consider um, what's going on if a child does require stabilisation, which Marcus spoke about before. Um, sometimes those straps can be pressing against the child's diaphragm um, or against their um, esophageal sphincter. So if they're respiratory compromised or if they've got reflux, sometimes where the restraints um, uh, do up on a child is not the ideal um, position to help with good feeding so or um, good breathing. So you just need to have a look at where those buckles and where those straps do um, press upon a child. So the second thing I want to talk about in terms of fact or fiction are tongue ties and tongue ties are a really topical issue at the moment. Um, depending on who you talk to, uh, tongue ties must be snipped. Well, actually, the truth around that is not all tongue ties need to be snipped. And the important thing to consider when we look at a tongue tie is does it impair or restrict tongue mobility and function? Children can have tongue ties that have no impact on their feeding or speech function. And to snip a tongue tie that doesn't impact on feeding or speech is really irresponsible. There's no reason for it. It costs the parents money. Um, it causes the child pain. And we've not gained anything because there was no loss in the first place. So if you have a look at that little picture there, you can see what a tongue tie is. You can see that there is that extra piece of skin there on the um, frenulum uh, that joins the tongue to the, root of the floor of the mouth. Um, and when it comes to looking at tongue tie, we really just need to work out, um, is it affecting feeding and is it affecting speech? So um, tongue ties can make it difficult for a baby to extend their tongue out past the lower lip. And that's one of the movements that we look for. Can that tongue poke out past the lip there? Um, that's necessary for the suction vacuum process of milk extraction. So the tongue will protrude out. Um, it will uh, push against the breast to create a vacuum inside the mouth so that the milk can flow in. Um, that, so the tongue does have to move for that, that um, process to occur. If the tongue doesn't 
protrude out. Often the baby will stabilize its mouth around the breast using a jaw, so it's more of a bite um, pattern, which will cause mum more pain and often cause the baby more fatigue. Um, the evidence for phrenotomy or the uh, snip of that tongue tie to improve feeding is low to insufficient in the research. So tongue tie release or um, the phrenotomy is recommended to be performed only by a trained health professional if the newborn has a significant tongue tie as assessed by professionals um, who have experience in the area and has an associated breastfeeding problem that cannot be improved by conservative management. So in fact, the main causes of difficulty with breastfeeding are related to positioning and poor latch, not tongue tie. The other thing that we need to ascertain is will it affect the child's speech and language? And again, there's little evidence to show that a tongue tie affects the overall clarity of a child's speech. But if there is significantly limited range of movement, the child might have difficulty with the sounds that are related to the tongue tip. So what makes up a good oromotor exam for a tongue tie when it comes to feeding? I just want to say here, this is not a full oromotor exam or to see how well all of the muscles um, and systems related to feeding are working. This is only for a tongue tie. We need to look at the tongue and the basic movement of it. Um, can the tongue get out past that bottom lip? Can the tongue move sideways um, in response to stimulus? But in addition to that, we need to really have a good look at the positioning of the baby during feeding and the latch of the baby. As I said before, these are the major causes of difficulties with breastfeeding, not tongue tie. We need to look at the, um, the breast itself, the type of nipple, the health of the breast and the appearance of the breast. Sometimes it's not to do with the baby that the baby's having trouble breastfeeding. Sometimes it's to do with the mother. Um, and we also need to have a look at child health. So some recent um, research that was done by Genther and his team um, in 2015 found that um, children with Pierre Robin syndrome, which is a respiratory system, um, syndrome, uh, oh, sorry, a syndrome that affects the respiratory system, um, it, many of the children who had a tongue tie there actually had very detrimental um, uh, outcomes in terms of their airway and breathing and two children actually died because the tongue um, actually blocked off that uh, airway. So it's really important for a child before they have um, a tongue tie snip to be assessed by, um, by a team of professionals who know what they're doing there. For an older child who may be um, breastfed well but is having trouble eating and, and a professional has noticed that they have a tongue tie and they're having difficulty moving food around um, in their mouth and controlling different types of food in their mouth. We really want to look at the tongue again and general movement. Can they elevate their tongue to the roof of the mouth, past their bottom lip, um, up to their top lip, around their lips, from cheek to cheek and from back teeth to back teeth. If a child can move their tongue in all of those um, planes of movement, then they have enough movement of that tongue to um, support good eating. We need to have a look at the overall eating process, how they move the food around in their mouth, whether they can lick their lips and if there's a mess around um, their mouth after they eat and if they try and clear that mess with their teeth instead of their tongue and whether food is pocketing in their cheeks um, as they're eating as well because the tongue can't um, get the food to um, push it back for a swallow. Um, there are some studies that look at measurement of tongue in older children and what the sufficient tongue um, protrusion length is um, and there's references at the end of this slide if you're interested in that. But basically what we um, say to parents, um, say to professionals that we train is just make a trip before you snip. Make a trip to see a speech pathologist who's trained in this area. Make a trip to see a dentist who's trained in this area um, before you go. It's a very quick solution to have a tongue tie snipped which doesn't always give us the outcome that we're looking for. Uh, the third thing I just wanted to talk about is um, this idea that feeding is just about eating. And I think Eve introduced us to this quite nicely, that um, eating is quite a lot about um, relationship and um, 
understanding each other and um, looking at all of the different skills involved. But this is a really nice graphic that comes out of the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne that looks at the different areas involved in feeding. So you can see that there's a social and emotional component a physical and sensory um, or a motor development component, a communication and cognitive development component, and then the actual meal time itself. So that's the, the time that we sit down um, and eat. And difficulty in any one of these areas can lead to feeding problems. If you think about this statement, if I say to you, hey, why don't you come over for dinner tonight? What comes to your mind? It's not just sitting down and eating the food. You imagine my table, you imagine the food on the table, um, you imagine the colours and the, the laughter and the talking and the interaction and the smell and um, you imagine that every now and then there's a couple of seconds of silence filled in with the background music and every now and then someone's knife will scrape on the plate and um, someone will knock over the wine and someone will let the gravy slop on the table. You know, there's so much more involved in that eating process than just putting your food in your mouth, chewing it and swallowing it. There's all of these, these four different components here. And we really need to look at each of those quite carefully when it comes to the feeding process. Um, so I'll talk quickly through these and there's one part that I just want to stop on as we go through because you can access a lot of this information through the Royal Children's um, website there that I've put on. But in terms of the social and emotional, we need to consider really that parent-child interaction which Eve spoke quite a bit about before. Um, thinking about the maternal or care on mental health, you know, if this child has been a problem feeder all the way along, they're probably stressed and um, anxious about mealtimes themselves now. Um, there could well be some postnatal depression. Um, and the children will pick up on these parental attitudes to food and mess and feeding. Um, we need to think about the language that's used around food. If it's stressful, anxious, demanding, commanding type language, then that social, emotional um, experience around food is not going to be a positive one. You know, I like to sit and talk and laugh and have fun with my friends when I eat, but I can imagine a child or a household that has a very fussy eater. They're going to just be focused on getting food into that child rather than enjoying the whole experience. Um, we need to think about the physical, sensory and oromotor um, development of the child. And this is what Marcus spoke quite a lot about. So learning to eat parallels our physical, sensory and oromotor development. Um, and as each of those systems develop in a child, the sophistication of food that they could or should tolerate um, will increase as well. Now, I know that Eve talked about this, but um, parents rate very highly that their children have feeding difficulties. Um, and a study done by Wright um, found that in typically developing children, so this is children who don't necessarily have any other developmental issues, parents will still consider that 20 to 50% of their children have feeding issues. So when do we know to call a feeding problem a feeding problem? I guess the, the main markers um, are around weight loss, excessive and ongoing elimination of foods, when a child becomes nutritionally compromised, when they're fussy past that toddler period or they have an inability to transition to the next stage, or when a child has an associated medical, social or relational issue. Um, that's when we could say that, yep, there probably is a, a feeding issue that we really need to talk about. Um, a new term that has come about is ARFID, which is Avoidant and Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Um, this came up in the DSM-5 and replaced um, a, a very wishy-washy diagnosis of feeding difficulties un otherwise unspecified. These kids will not eat just in response to hunger. They will only eat their preferred foods. Um, it's beyond picky eating and these kids don't grow out of it. So we might see um, a two-year-old in the clinic who um, was a picky eater who didn't necessarily um, choose to do anything beyond find out that they really were a picky eater and they might represent again as a 13 or a 14 year old child who's very stressed about going to school camp because they still only eat three or four types of food. Um, and so this doesn't necessarily resolve without some sort of intervention, whether it be an SOS type intervention that Marga spoke about or um, the Ellen Satter model that Eve spoke about. Um, these are 
uh, ARFID is quite a complex um, eating presentation. There's many uh, factors that are involved. Um, I've put that little graphic in the notes for you and I'll make these notes available to you as well. Um, and it really takes a team to uh, work on this type of feeding difficulty, um, a very slow approach, a very coordinated approach, um, looking at all of these different systems um, and a, a quite a structured um, approach to each of those areas as well, depending on which area the children struggle with the most. So um, traditionally, speech pathologists would be thought to look at swallowing rather than the whole feeding process, but swallowing is actually only one portion of the feeding process. And the goal of swallowing is just to get the food to the stomach. Um, there's two phases in a swallow, the oral phase, which is the taking the food off the um, utensil, chewing it, pulling it into a bolus or a ball and then moving that bolus to the back of the mouth. So that um, portion of the swallow is voluntary. We generally have control over that um, phase. A child with um, poor breathing, a child with poor um, muscle strength, a child with sensory issues may have difficulty with that oral phase because um, you can't, it's really hard, you know, when you've got a cold, it's really hard to chew and breathe at the same time. If you don't like the feel of the food in your mouth, you want to spit it out and you don't want to swallow it. Um, and then the um, pharyngeal phase of the swallow is when the food hits the back of the mouth um, and then goes down. You can see on that x-ray there, whoops, I've just lost myself. Um, on that x-ray there, um, so the voluntary phase finishes here and then the food goes down into the stomach and that's involuntary, that just happens. So if a child does have difficulties with swallowing, we look at modifying the food texture and consistency. We look at modifying their position and posture, and we look at modifying the mechanics of a swallow. So again, it comes back to um, that whole foundation of breathing, the whole foundation of positioning of muscle, and then of the, um, the texture and consistency of the food. So um, a study by Barnard, Hammond and Booth found that the principle underlying all feeding interventions is to establish a, a smooth and congenial feeding relationship that is appropriate for each child's developmental stage and nutritional needs. Um, that was very highly supported by what Eve presented. Um, high quality feeding interactions during the first years of life tend to be positively linked to the child's subsequent cognitive and linguistic competence and to more secure attachments to major caregivers. So we need to look at the language, we need to look at the skills. You know, if, if what we're asking a child to do is way beyond their ability and if the language around feeding is um, negative or um, discouraging or, um, you know, not conducive to a good time, we're not only going to have negative feeding experiences, but we're going to actually miss opportunities to build up a child's cognitive and linguistic skills. You know, mealtimes are a perfect time for conversation and talking about textures and flavours and colours and smells and, and all of those different bits and pieces. Um, and then the final thing that we need to look at, according to that uh, Royal, Ch Melbourne, Royal Children's Hospital from Melbourne's model, is just having a look at mealtime. You know, encourage parents to take a step back and look at the big picture through their child's eyes. Is the environment too noisy or too quiet? Is it too busy? Does the child need some form of extra stimulation to remain engaged, like those um, uh, low threshold children, uh, sorry, high threshold children that uh, Marga spoke about? What time is the meal being offered? What are you feeding them and when? Right, really does breakfast have to mean cereal? Or can you be flexible in the foods that you choose to expand a child's experience with eating? And what is the overall tone of the meal? If you have to, encourage or help a parent, assist a parent to change it up and start again. So that's a very um, quick romp through some of the um, key sticking points that we come across in terms of um, feeding in the clinic here with parents, the things that cause stress. Um, and if you do would do want more information on those things, um, these references will be available to you uh, through my um, slides. So thank you very much. That's great. Thanks so much, Kylie. 
really great content, ladies. Okay, we do have um, some questions. So we might just have a bit of a, a um, discussion. If you could all take yourselves off um, mute and so I can, we can all see your lovely faces again. <laughs> Um, so we've had we've had a really nice question come through, and I think we should maybe chat about that first. So thank you, Jess, for your question. Um, all the panelists can see it, but I might just read it out for the benefit of um, our other participants. So um, the question is: What would you recommend for adolescents that have major sensory issues? Um, so currently, the, oops, I've just lost it. Currently, this person is. Uh, is being provided with the foods that they like to eat. So all that crunchy stuff, noodles, crackers, biscuits. Um, would you recommend more options for each meal to get the extra exposure or are there any complications in terms of nutrition um, for these students? And I guess um, from Marga's perspective, it, it's really to look at the, the complex sensory things going on first. Yeah. Um, what about from your perspective, Eve? Um. Can you, is my um, video on? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't see it. Oh, um, we can see all of you and we can hear all of you. So go for okay. it. What do you think? Well, I think um, that parents need to be considerate without catering. And mm. what I mean by that is not just giving, um, offering the child the foods that they know they will eat, um, if this child isn't being offered a variety of foods, how do we know if they'll eat it? Um, mm. So, you know, it's like the child who's given um, the three meals that the parent knows that they will eat, like, you know, whether it's one time it's spaghetti bolognese, fish fingers, and then chicken. Vegemite sandwiches. <laughs> and so that's all they're exposed to. So mm. this um, adolescent could have, at, at, I um, teach parents to offer at each meal a protein, foods that contain protein, fat yeah. and carbohydrate. So the foods that have been mentioned here don't, uh, a lot of them don't contain any fat or protein. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, are foods that they could be offering that um, are still crunchy, but but they can be offering other foods as well. If children never see fruit because mm. the carers have given up on offering them fruit, then how are they ever going to learn to like it? If they never are offered fruit as part of a family meal and they see their parents eating it and enjoying it, how are they going to learn to eat fruit mm. or, just, or any other food? So that's mm. one thing. And secondly, from a nutrition point of view, they would need to be assessed and see, you know, maybe for the time being, they need um, supplementation with vitamins and minerals if they're not eating, yeah. for example, any iron containing foods or any, um, you know, it's hard to know. I always get um, parents to um, fill in a food diary for four days before they come and see me so I get an idea of yeah. their nutritional intake so they would need a, an assessment from a dietitian to know whether they're nutritionally um, okay mm. but, the, but as well as that they need repeated um, neutral exposure and when I say neutral it means there is no pressure on the child to eat the food or not. So mm. you might offer for afternoon tea some fruit, some crackers and some milk um, and let them pick and choose, but without any pressure on them to pick any particular food and repeatedly. So, mm. yeah. Um, and this adolescent has also um, also drinking juice or flavored milk but only out of the bottle or only drink bottles so Kylie that might be an aspect for you to have a chat about yeah potentially it could be related to how they could manage a cup or another device um, Ooh. that squeaks back Kylie <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's probably more related to um, a sensory issue or a rule based issue that they've developed that I will only drink this in this bottle. And it's not unheard of for children to mm -hmm. only um, take their drink out of a particular type, colour, mm -hmm. brand of bottle. Um, and again, it wouldn't be about um, necessarily depriving them of that or suddenly changing or anything, but making different um, options available. So um, having it in the bottle, in a different cup, in a different um, container with a straw, without a straw, so that yeah. there are options. Again, they're never going to learn if they, they don't get the opportunity to learn. Yeah. And warm versus cold, I, I would presume, right. you know, all those kinds of sensory things. Have you got anything else to add there, Margot? No, I would, you know, from my point of view, I would definitely address all the sensory issues. Um, drinking out of the bottle like that is often also um, because they don't like the smell and if it's in the bottle they don't really smell it. So that, mm. that um, takes away one of the senses at least, so it can be overwhelming to drink something that you don't like the smell, you don't like the taste, you don't like the, the texture, and then at least if you take the smell away, at least it's one less sense. So, um, but I definitely would address all the sensory things. And what I have seen um, and what I see and um, think about um, in this adolescence is that sometimes um, it's easier to address the, the senses that aren't the most pressing and the, the most severe and start from there. For instance, if this child is also noise sensitive but it's not as severe as the eating, then rather start with the noise sensitivity and work your way um, from there, that um, you often get better results and a more positive child. Get and start with the easy wins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess uh, moving on to our next topic, any effective strategies that any of you ladies might, might come across to address the family issues impacting on feeding mm -hmm. and feeding problems? Um, depends what the family issue is. <laughs> um, sometimes um, if it's, um, I mean, it could be, a family issue it's not I, that's very broad so I, I mm. really don't know what to address here um, you know so in it, terms of obviously if there's any any social issues or if there's if um, somebody else another family member have issues with food um, or routine or meal times or, or anything like that yeah, so um, yeah. you know a lot well just starting with family meals there's a lot of families who don't have family meals and mm. have reasons why not to have family meals. But um, it's a matter of talking with, well, what are the barriers to that? And often um, um, mums in particular will say, well, I feed the children when they're hungry and then I wait and eat with my mm. husband or partner when they get home. And by talking about, well, what's imp you're here because of a problem that you have with your child's eating, um, one of the major things that you could do about that is eat with the children. Mm, and model and, those behaviours. Yeah. And yeah. whoever, I mean, there's always going to be one adult at home with children eating. Um, that parent needs to eat with the child in order to model those behaviours and also to provide the food and to give, you know, to, um, to actually, you know, it, I always, um, I would always encourage parents to make one meal of what the parent wants to eat and not <laughs> pass it to the child. Um, because once again, if you're not challenging them, that the proviso is that there's always one food available that you know the child will eat if they're hungry. So it's not about um, about um, being mean or punishing them because they won't eat the food. They always has to have either bread or pasta or rice on the table that you know they will eat. Um, but it's if they're here, if it's such an issue, then they need to make some changes at home and mm. and the dad can eat later on and the, and the mum can sit with him and enjoy his company but she doesn't have to 
in necessarily be eating. Mm -hmm. And it make, you know, many mums are making two or three meals a day <laughs> and a night and also providing, you know, four other meals a day for their children because snacks are just as important as meal as other meals for children. They don't differentiate well, this is snack time. They're hungry and they'll eat because it's eating time. So if that if the issue is around a family meal, um, if an issue is about, oh well, one of the parents doesn't eat vegetables or doesn't eat the food that they want their children to eat, then <laughs> um, I guess it's talking about, well, there are um, you know, not everybody is going to eat every food and it doesn't really matter if a four-year-old's not eating vegetables um, at this stage, if they're, eat if they're nutritionally adequate, um, if they're eating fruit and no vegetables, it's not really a big deal um, nutritionally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's also ways of relaxing parents and not um, decreasing that anxiety that they're not eating yeah. like an adult at four years of age. <laughs> that um, reminds me of my two small humans at home. They like to eat all of their items individually and separate. Thanks very well, much. <laughs> yeah. and they don't so like their flavours blended. <laughs> I would always encourage families to um, serve the food buffet style on the table. Yeah, I was going to ask about yeah. that. Children who just by their temperament and their character, the mm. minute they put the food on their plate, they're going to push it away and become yeah. upset or whatever because they're not having the control and mm. they want, you know, they, there is some sort of autonomy that you can give to children. They're not choosing yeah. the menu and they're not choosing the time of the meal, but they can choose what to Something. put on their plate. Yeah, and sure. And so... I very much encourage um, buffet style or whatever you want to call it, um, mm. eating. And Eve, you do um, some online consultations. In fact, you all do. Um, but I was just wondering about online um, feeding clinics or is there anything that you guys know of? Um, I know you have the, the feeding clinic here on the Sunshine Coast, Kylie. Mm. Is there anything online that's available for um, you know, clients out rural and remote? Um, we can do sessions, um, obviously, via Zoom or via Skype or whatever um, yep. suits the families, yeah. Cool. Okay. Are there any other questions from anybody, panellist or speaker? Um, I found it really interesting, Kylie, that the um, ARFID is now part of the, the DSM. That's really interesting. Yes. Um, yeah, so um, I would presume then that obviously it's a, it's a multidisciplinary approach, but particularly um, from a mental health perspective. Yes, um, mm. definitely. And an interesting statistic around that is only 63% of um, paediatric medical specialists are even aware of it. Yeah, wow. So the message going back to parents will be just wait and see, let them be hungry, they'll eat yeah. when they're ready, when unfortunately for these really complex kids it's not going to happen. Mm. And anxiety aside, you know, the parents know the kids the best, I guess. And, That's right. and um, you know, sometimes parent gut instinct um, is worth listening to, isn't it? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, for, let me just check again from anybody. Um, we're, we're over time, but that always happens. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to really thank all three of you again for your time um, and your, your valuable content. Um, I can make sure that the recording and the presentations are available um, for our participants. So there's certainly a lot of people that were very interested in this session um, that will be watching the recording. So, and again, I'd just like to really plug our um, Allied Health Virtual Conference website, lots of business-based and clinical based web, um, webinars coming up every week so keep a bit of an eye on that and also of course the Australian Allied Health Awards everybody should be nominating go 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 <laughs> we've got a brilliant networking gala event in Brisbane so that's alliedhealthawards.com.au okay without further ado I'll let everybody go and have some dinner <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much thanks everybody. again thank you and you spend time with you thank you so much Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye. See you later.